Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking a bit about Operation Sea Lion, the planned invasion of Britain uh, by Nazi Germany, uh, and the reasons why the operation was finally uh, finally scrapped and indefinitely postponed, and its relationship uh, with the ongoing Battle of Britain. Now, if you're a regular listener, you'll know that I've been looking at the summer of 1940 for uh, the last few weeks uh, from a number of different perspectives, British, German, French and American. And we're going to gradually uh, move on and look at uh, the war as it unfolds, phase by phase. Uh, But I think that this period of time is so important because between the summer of 1940 and, I guess, uh, the winter of 1941, the fate of Nazi Germany particularly, I believe, is decided in a number of what Ian Kershaw describes as fateful decisions. But I won't be drawing from Ian Kershaw today. I'll be looking at Anthony Beaver's history of the Second World War, which, as a, a general reader, is uh, second to none, really, uh, as a modern exploration of the war. Uh, really, really uh, should be in the kind of the arsenal of uh, every history enthusiast and student. Following the uh, signing of the armistice between France and Germany in the uh, train carriage in Compain, the Compain Forest, where the original armistice in 1918 was sound, uh, signed, um, Hitler, in a moment of triumphalism, describes it as the greatest victory in world history. And he, the bells are rung across Germany and Hitler allows himself... Uh, a little tour um, in the early light of Paris, along with his favourite architect, Arno Brecker. And he looked at Paris, and he was toying with the idea of having Paris raised to the ground. And then he thought, in his in typical vanity, that this wasn't necessary, that Paris would simply wither away once he, uh, Hitler's new planned capital, Germania, um, was built, which would uh, dwarf Paris. However... Um, Hitler, when he returns to the Anhalter station in Berlin by train, is re- greeted by cheering crowds and adulation. And his popularity levels, even among non-Nazis, even among um, sceptics, even among um, former social democrats, uh, leaps to almost unimaginable levels. And this is probably the one moment in Hitler's career where he was genuinely, universally popular uh, across Germany. The popular sentiment was uh, either one of awe and disbelief at the scale of the victory, or from more cautious uh, observers, a grudging admiration that he had actually pulled it off. And despite everything else, he'd managed to do in six weeks what the Kaiser had failed to do in four years. However, there's a gnawing doubt in the back of Hitler's mind. Hitler had assumed that the British would already have um, approached Germany for peace terms long before now. But Britain's first act was the destruction of the French fleet at Oran. Um, And you can catch that on the podcast I did on the consequences of Dunkirk. Apocryphally, uh, the French general Hunziger, who signed the armistice, uh, said that the armistice would only have any value for France if Britain was to follow suit within the next 12 weeks. Otherwise, they had, uh, the the signatories, the French signatories, would have committed an almighty crime against France itself. The reasoning in France, uh, Vichy France and Germany, was that Britain would realise its hopelessness and would never be be able to hold out alone and that Churchill would be quickly overthrown um, and deposed by a United um, Peace Party or a, an Armistice Party uh, in the House of Commons. One of Hitler's main handicaps was uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop. Uh, Ribbentrop, had, his star had rather fallen by this point. However, he had uh, for years fed wildly misleading reports about the workings of British political life back to Hitler in the 1930s on his various visits to uh, Britain uh, as Hitler's representative and then ambassador. 
he uh, informed Hitler that the House of Commons had no power anyway and that the uh, country was run by 200 aristocratic families uh, who made things happen. This was all guesswork by uh, Ribbentrop and uh, wildly misleading guesswork at that. So it gives you a flavour of Hitler's misunderstanding and confusion about British intentions in the summer of 1940. Hitler had to consider uh, what to do and what move to make next, and uh, particularly what to do about Great Britain. He thought about possible strategies for a few days, and then discussed with his commanders-in-chief and issued Directive Number 16 for the pre preparations of a landing operation against England. The uh, impression that one gets from this is that it is a decision taken in haste, based on poor information, and one which doesn't really address the real priorities of uh, Hitler's war and what Hitler, Hitler's actual war aims were. Really, it was to uh, finally um, deal with the last remaining nuisance in the West before the real business of conquering the East uh, occurs. But it also tells us that in the few days between Hitler's return and the, dis the uh, issuing of Directive 16, that the belief that Britain would come to terms must have evaporated from Hitler's mind. There was already a working plan in place. Um, the uh, study Nordvest, um, which had been completed in the December of 1939. Um, the Kriegsmarine's losses in Norway led Admiral Raider to insist that an invasion couldn't happen by sea alone, and it could only happen if the um, air superiority from the, with the using the Luftwaffe had been achieved over uh, England in the first place. The army, represented by Franz Halder, is a lot more cautious and tell Hitler that invasion should only be uh, the last resort and it needed to be uh, very well planned and given uh, a great deal of attention. But the task rested uh, upon the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, and the, there was such a shortage of ships and craft to take 100,000 men, the first wave of invasion, uh, across the Channel, along with enough tanks, vehicles, lorries, staff cars, armoured cars, motorcycles and all the works. And the naval escort force that would accompany in it, it would be no match for the Royal Navy. Given the fact that autumn was uh, heading soon and the uh, window between the calm seas of the summer months and the choppier waters of the autumn and winter was rapidly closing, so there wasn't really the time to do the operation in. The real enthusiasts for the operation are the uh, SS, um, the Gestapo and the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, Hick the uh, security department uh, of the SS. Walter Schellenberg, the SS spymaster, um, had a, a list of everyone from George Orwell through to Winston Churchill, who was to be uh, arrested and no doubt executed, um, 2,820 individuals who were going to be seized uh, during and after the invasion. Hitler knew enough um, to know that the disintegration of the British Empire, which would happen almost automatically, Britain fell, with Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Dominions, India, uh, and large portions of Africa declaring their independence uh, from a uh, fascist Britain, which would have been created by Hitler, uh, putting Oswald Mosley in number 10 and Edward VIII on the throne, would lead to a serious international destabilisation and powers like America, Japan and the Soviet Union would quickly seize the colonies that the British had abandoned or that had decided to proclaim their independence. This in turn would pour resources into the hands of future targets like the Soviet Union and possible adversaries like the USA it would give the Japanese opportunities that Hitler had not previously considered 
and change the strategic picture of the world in ways that Hitler hadn't bargained for. So he was aware that a disintegration of the British Empire could actually cause all sorts of unintended and unforeseen problems. And another figure in uh, Hitler's uh, arsenal of advisers who was feeding him all manner of misleading reports was, of course, Hermann Goering, the new Reich Marshal, who was head of the Luftwaffe and who claimed that Britain could be defeated from the air within a relatively short time period. But one glance at the Luftwaffe would have told, and even a casual observer, that this wasn't true. The Luftwaffe wasn't prepared for this kind of operation. Um, the the belief that Goering had was that the British would, were going to capitulate anyway. And so there wasn't much of a time after the Battle of France to re-equip squadrons and repurpose them for a different kind of aerial campaign. The Luftwaffe, um, Stuka dive bombers and Heinkel dive bombers, were ideal for strafing columns of civilians, they were ideal for attacking British soldiers on the beaches of Dunkirk, and they were ideal for terror attacks on uh, places, fortress cities such as Sedan. For heavy, um, long-term bombing campaigns on British airfields, infrastructure, and uh, the Dowding radar system, they're not that useful. Because dive bombers are quite slow and would find themselves flying in a, probably the best defended part of uh, uh, airspace in the world. In the Battle of France, the British had lost 930 aircraft. Uh, the Germans had lost 1,284. The uh, adoption of airfields in northern France, which put the Luftwaffe in range of Great Britain, was a much more prolonged and drawn-out affair than had previously been considered. Not only does everything seem to be done uh, at the beginnings of the Battle of Britain in a very kind of chaotic way, uh, far more chaotic than the kind of the popular myth of a Nazi efficiency, um, which is really quite a myth, um, would allow us to believe, but also it just suggests that it's really not a key priority. And as I previously mentioned on the other podcast, later on, veterans of the Battle of Britain, German veterans of the Battle of Britain, um, all uh, attest to the fact that it was widely seen as something of a sideshow, not really one of the more important air campaigns of the war. And in July 1940, the focus of the Luftwaffe isn't even on actual mainland Britain. It's on destroying shipping in the Channel and the, the, the Thames estuary. This uh, was referred to as the Canal Camp, the uh, Channel War, and mainly Stuka bombers, and uh, accompanied by um, torpedo boats, um, shut down the English Channel, and preventing any shipping from making it. And this is why you find along the uh, western coast um, of Great Britain, um, from Liverpool down to uh, well Glasgow, Liverpool, um, some of the Welsh ports, Cardiff and Swansea, uh, Bristol, and um, and the like, uh, become the nerve centres of British shipping. The one of the most bombed parts of the UK is Western approaches in Liverpool, the uh, nerve centre of the British maritime fleet. These were the only conduits into Britain because um, it was impossible also to use eastern ports on the North Sea. They, uh, they become of primary importance of keeping the country going during the war. And obviously they are major targets for bombing as uh, cities like uh, Bristol and Swansea and Cardiff can attest to. One thing that Hitler clearly didn't understand and he makes a speech on the 19th of July to the Kroll Opera House which shows his lack of understanding is that Churchill was now an unassailable figure in British politics uh, following the uh, evacuation at Dunkirk and his speeches to the House. But he also uh, didn't understand that Churchill couldn't moderate his stance even if he wanted to. 
For Churchill, this would have been political suicide, the idea that he had rallied the nation and then was prepared to compromise. So there was no uh, possibility, even though Hitler makes his final speech on the 19th of July, asking for an appeal to reason and um, becoming intensely frustrated with the uh, intransigence of the British, he um, misunderstands really what dynamics are going on within British society. The British, for their part, took the threat of invasion extremely seriously. Most of the equipment of the British Expeditionary Force had been uh, abandoned on the, the beaches of Dunkirk, and uh, as we've already seen in previous podcasts, uh, Churchill appealed directly to Roosevelt to help, uh, essentially saying, um, we uh, demanding assistance as opposed to asking for it. Churchill uh, tapped into a narrative that exists within sort of British historical discourses um, about how Britain tends to be the underdog at the start of any conflict, and this was certainly true um, with Napoleonic Wars, but at the end um, the British would ha have their day. It was unclear to most people how this would happen. But to Churchill, from 1940 onwards, it was abundantly clear that it would be with American help. It seems that one of the main worries that the uh, chiefs of staff, the British chiefs of staff had, was the defence of aircraft factories. The RAF was dependent on new aircraft. So they'd lost 136 pilots in France and had 700 planes ready to fly uh, in the Battle of Britain. But it was the productive capacity of Britain that's really the key to understanding the, the Battle of Britain. The, the British could produce nearly 500 new aircraft a month, and this was almost double the amount of aircraft that the Germans could produce. The British, short on manpower, could call from their dominions and colonies for aviators, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, South African, Indian, uh, West Indian um, pilots and air crew came to fight in Britain. And let's obviously not forget the Poles and the Czechs and the French, Dutch and Belgian aviators who also crossed the Channel, escaped, and um, Norwegian and Danish uh, as well. Experienced pilots were worth their weight in gold. The uh, freshly trained pilot was the one most likely to be shot down and the uh, Poles bring 8,000 Air Force personnel um, following the, the, the fall of Poland. They were um, men with combat experience and the uh, cultural and the strategic integration with the RAF is, is very slow and postponed. The Poles under General Sikorsky demanded uh, an independent Polish Air Force, but the RAF veto this, and they bring instead the Poles into the RAF Volunteer Reserve, and they suddenly are the, the more um, conservative with a small c uh, British uh, pilots who are used to flying in fixed formations suddenly realise that the Poles are extraordinary pilots. Their unorthodox uh, attitude, their um, sheer determination and bravery and their uh, refusal really to listen to uh, senior British commanders um, earn them the kind of the, the title of being the crazy Poles. And of course they are powered on by revenge and relish the opportunity to take on the Luftwaffe over the South Downs of Great Britain. But there are all sorts of memoirs um, that you can find from the various uh, Polish veterans associations across Great Britain of a deep affection that the British had for the Poles and, and vice versa. The um, huge excitement that British people had on seeing the, the Poles arrive and the uh, camaraderie and friendship and the um, admiration that Poles were fighting to keep Britain free and also, you know, in the long term, fighting to regain their own country. So uh, there was a great deal of solidarity there. And the contribution of Polish fighters to Great Britain's freedom, um, sadly forgotten these days, 
really does bear remembering. At the height of the Battle of Britain, one in every ten pilots in the southeast of England, where most of the fighting was done, were Polish. On the 13th of July, the first Polish squadron of pilots was formed, and within a month, um, the British allowed uh, General Sikorsky to establish the Polish Air Force with its own fighter and bomber squadrons under RAF command. Hitler sensed that Churchill was waiting for the Soviet Union to go to war with Nazi Germany. On the 31st of July, he summons a meeting at the Berghof um, with his generals, and he begins to discuss the invasion of the Soviet Union. He begins to say that it is only through the destruction of the Soviet Union that the British will realise that they are completely alone and completely defeated and that nobody is coming to their rescue. He said, With Russia smashed, Britain's last hope would be shattered. Germany will then be master of Europe and the Balkans. Now, it's important not to overstate the importance of this in terms of Hitler's decisions for invading the Soviet Union. These were long-considered plans, and the idea that Hitler simply wanted to invade the Soviet Union in order to break Britain, I don't think makes complete sense, but I do think it is a contributory factor. Now, as we go on in the next few weeks, we'll get closer to Barbarossa, and we'll discuss it in more depth then. The timing for Britain uh, suddenly seems right at the end of July. Um, the Goering assumes it will take a matter of weeks. Um, the morale of the Luftwaffe is high following the defeat of France. Um, the numerical superiority um, on, before manufacturing is factored in seems to be going in the direction of the uh, Luftwaffe, just to have a look at some of the um, stats here. In France there are 656 Messerschmitt Me 109s, 168 Me 110 twin-engine fighters, 769 Dornier, Heinkel and Junkers 88 bombers, and 316 Stuka dive bombers against 504 Hurricanes and Spitfires um, commanded by Hugh Dowding. By this point, already probing attacks on British airfields uh, air and fighters had uh, taken place to see how quickly it would be possible to wear down the RAF uh, in the skies. And British fighters had been uh, called up to defend uh, airspaces and defend um, coastal radar stations. Radar stations and the Observer Corps uh, across um, uh, Britain along with uh, communications networks, buried um, telephone lines, command centres, um, the Dowding system in essence, which I hope to talk about in uh, a separate podcast, meant that the British were extraordinarily efficient in getting aircraft to the enemy, uh, that there didn't have to be a long period of time in the RAF getting into the air and doing long patrols uh, along the coast and, and the channel. Getting fighters into the air quickly to save on fuel and getting them up to combat altitude meant that the um, fighters could be there for longer. And this was one of the key distinctions, the one of the key game changers for the British in the Battle of Britain. The uh, Luftwaffe couldn't be in, the, in British airspace for long enough because they had to fly from France. Hugh Dowding, the Air Chief Marshal and commander of the RAF, had built the, the complex Dowding system of command centres and communications before the war. And he had also made the decision to hold back Spitfire squadrons during the Battle of France. Um, and this obviously doesn't include the Battle of Dunkirk, but he didn't want most of the RAF stationed in France for the airfields to be overrun and the air crews to be captured or killed and the planes to be de destroyed. He uh, fell foul of Churchill on this uh, score, and Churchill was uh, determined to uh, destroy Dowding as soon as possible in a typical Churchillian vindictiveness. However, it transpires that Dowding's decision was absolutely correct. And both Dowding and Air Marshal Keith Park, who was the commander of 11 Group, which was going to defend the most important part of uh, important um, sector, uh, London and the South East, um, were able to listen to their air crews, 
to uh, get feedback on what it is the air crews um, needed and the um, this normally meant the air crews wanted um, the old hidebound uh, tactics and doctrines of the RAF to be disbanded for more flexible approaches to dealing with the enemy. Now in the next podcast on this topic we're going to look at uh, the Eagle Day, uh, the Adler Tag, which was the first day of the offensive against Great Britain. Um, and we'll continue this uh, in uh, the next couple of hours. Thanks very much, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Do remember to give us a good thumbs up on iTunes, uh, and if you can, check out our Patreon page, um, and uh, if you can sponsor us, that would be grand. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye.